Fox News alert now. The war in Afghanistan is officially over, as Jennifer just said. The last American warplanes carrying U.S. troops have left Afghan airspace, and the Taliban announcing it is officially in control of the Kabul airport. The Pentagon says American citizens are still there, and the State Department will work to get the remaining Americans out. Secretary of State Antony Blinken set to speak at any moment on this breaking news. We'll take it around our table first, though. Uh, Pete, having served, uh, I mean, this must be filled with a lot of different emotions. Yeah, it's almost surreal, it's almost surreal to, to see that banner at the, at the bottom right there, America ends war in Afghanistan. Uh, I will say this, setting aside all the criticisms I and many others have had, I am very glad that every one of our boys at this point is off of that airfield off of that kill zone, off of that X. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can, you can talk about what was mismanaged, you can talk about the future, and we're gonna talk a lot about that, about the people left behind, about the people come, about the legitimized terror states that, that's there. But ultimately, I gotta tip my hat all to, the, to the Pentagon using an element of surprise, mm -hmm. moving earlier than uh, many people would, would think they would, and getting all our boys back. So it, it has not been a um, smooth process. We've lost 13 American lives, almost uh, two dozen additionally wounded. That will not be forgotten, but it's, it's a good thing mm -hmm. that we're not a target of ISIS-K or Al-Qaeda or Haqqani right now. Greg Gutfeld. I agree with everything Pete just said, so that's all from me. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. No, but I do agree. I, I, you know, I think that it's, it's a relief to know that this is over, but we know that in some ways it's not. Yeah. I mean, we also know that the analysis will not be over. If that was over, I'd be out of a job. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, it's just weird when you hear like it is a new Afghanistan at the same day that you hear that they executed a folk singer. So there's all these other elements out there. And then, of course, you have these conflicting stories about whether or not ISIS and Taliban, they hate each other, but then why did they release all the ISIS people from prison? I don't understand that either. The demilitarization, is that what the word is, for the equipment? Mm -hmm. um, he mentioned a few of it, but there's like tons and tons. You saw that graph that came out yesterday in the Times of all the Amazing. weapons. I think, so, but the real thing now is, is account, who's going to be accountable for the big botch? Because that's what this is. This was the big botch. Uh, and and it was, it's actually, oddly, a blunder made up of smaller blunders. And I don't know if it's all Joe's fault. But it sure feels that way because he's the guy at the top. But we need to, you know, we need to find out. I mean, like, if, did the Taliban actually offer a control of the airport? And did we decline that? That's a pretty huge blunder. Uh, and that was, that's, it, it's, it, it's paled by the other bl blunders. But you can go, you can keep going through them and through them and find them. I think that's a, it's an important thing to look at because this, I think it's going to be, I, I don't think it's as rosy as it's going to look for the next couple of weeks. Or, and certainly possibly <coughs> beyond. Geraldo, you were there uh, many times um, and covered many war zones, um, not covered ma many ends. Well, you know, I was not here on the five last week. So I, I want to express how gut-wrenching and heartbreaking those deaths were and how that affects everything, including my analysis of uh, even though it was an, an, in, uh, an incident, uh, it was more than that. It was symbolic of so much. And delving into the 13 who died and the, the, the two of them women and the Navy corpsman from close to where I live in, in Ohio and five of them Latinos of the 13, mm -hmm. it's, it's, so proud of them, loved them so much, so pained by, uh, by their death. The stunning end of this war is something that is really shaking me to my core. It is a, an, a, an amazing thing. 20 years, it's been a big part of my life. It's why I came uh, to Fox News. All of us have, yeah. you know, some personal effect of this, uh, of this uh, story and this trauma. We left with honor, I have to say. Uh, the services performed magnificently. If the Taliban bodyguards had been better, if the line had held and the, the 13 had not been killed, I think we would have forgiven President Biden uh, already for uh, the mismanage, the bungled uh, evacuation at the beginning. I'm delighted that they, uh, they demilitarized those aircraft, which means they made them inoperable, unusable. So we didn't, what we left behind was a lot of small arms and stuff they already had. In terms of the threat to the homeland, 
I'm of the school that says we have over the horizon capability to strike if we see them, uh, you know, coagulating again. I, I think ISIS is very low tech right now. Uh, but as a father who had a daughter in Paris in 2015 for the attack that killed over 150 French people, uh, it doesn't take a lot of technology to cause a lot of harm. So I, I, I think, sadly, that's in our future. I think we have that violence in our future. We have to guard against it. God bless TSA and all the rest of them. Uh, it's going to be a, a wild time. I personally am relieved that the war is over. Katie, General McKenzie said there's a lot of heartbreak with this departure, and he was talking about those that were left behind, including some Americans, like 250, they say 250 Americans, the numbers are hard to get, uh, but also the um, special immigrant visas, the interpreters, and others who helped in the war. I was talking to a Marine friend last week who was talking about what's going to happen when we left. And he also agrees that we need to leave Afghanistan, but he said once the lights go off and the cameras are not rolling, it's going to be medieval beyond anything that people can see. And so... Looking at the end of the war, I flash back to 9-11 and how we got here. I was 13 years old, and a lot of my friends went, and they served their country. And I just want to say thank you to them for yeah. everything that they have lost and, and sacrificed for our country. Um, you know, we knew it was going to happen, but it's, uh, the reality of it is a lot to take in and, and uh, process. But I am deeply grateful for the Americans who put it all on the line, including the 13 last week to uh, keep us safe, and I, I hope agree. that we can continue to do that. And we, and we add our voices to that and lift them up and their families. Uh, we, uh, Jennifer Griffin has been at the Pentagon with us, helping us think through all of these issues, reporting just um, incredibly well, Jennifer, throughout this entire war. Uh, let's get your thoughts as this comes to an end on August 30th. Well, Dana, I just came out of the Pentagon briefing where General McKenzie announced that those last five military planes had cleared Afghan airspace. We learned that on the last flight out was General Donahue, the head of the 82nd Airborne, who was one of the top military commanders on the ground, along with the ambassador, uh, the State Department, DOD, leaving hand in hand with the American flag on that last flight out. Um, heartbreaking images in terms of what General McKenzie had to admit, which was that they did not get every American out who wanted to leave. Um, he mentioned that this will move from a military phase to a diplomatic phase, and that the Department of State will work tirelessly to get any American out who wants to get out by working with those uh, partners on the ground, um, which include the Qataris, who will have an embassy open, the Turks, who have their embassy, and who will be in charge of, in control of the airport. The Turkish NATO allies will work with the Taliban to get that airport operational so that uh, that uh, commercial flights can come back in. Uh, General McKenzie was very clear that the military took a decision not to destroy uh, aspects of the airport, o operational aspects of the airport, uh, so that things like fire trucks and, and command and control, so that the uh, civilian aircraft can begin coming in, because there's going to be a humanitarian disaster otherwise. General McKenzie also made the point that the Taliban is going to have its hands full, because, as he said, there are 2,000 ISIS-K fighters, ISIS fighters that the Taliban themselves let out of the, the prisons, the two key prisons, one at Bagram Air Base, one at Pulish. Uh, 2,000 hardened ISIS uh, fighters, that's going to be a problem, because there are no Americans there right now, no American forces there right now for them to target. Uh, they're going to turn their weapons on the Taliban. And so that is, I think, the tonight, I think, I feel certainly the way uh, I hear Geraldo and I hear Katie and the emotion in everyone's voices, we all feel it. The military here in this building, they feel it. Uh, this is has been a long 20 years, and the war is over, but uh, the heartbreak continues. And we're going to take it around some for some questions. Jen, I think Pete has one for you now. Jennifer, yeah, it's Pete Hexeth. Geraldo uh, said that, you know, we left with honor, and there's no doubt that our troops performed honorably. There is honor in every aspect of what our troops have done over the last 20 years. Just a lot of people feel like the way that we left in the last couple of weeks was not honorable, that it was a retreat, that it was at the behest of the Taliban. We just saw the press conference from the Department of Defense. We will soon see a press conference from the Department of State. Do you feel like this is the moment with all our troops home that the finger pointing begins? Because ultimately it was not a process handled properly. Uh, do, you, do you get a sense that from DOD and state there's going to be an attempt to rewrite the narrative of who's to blame for what didn't go right? 
I think for the finger pointing to begin this soon is a is a bit unseemly, frankly, and that is not the impression that I have from uh, the people who've been working tirelessly since August 14th. I've seen people here at the Pentagon as well as at the Department of State. Many of them will remain nameless over the years, but they worked and they were heroic in their efforts. And the fact that they got 122,000 vulnerable Afghans and Americans out of that country when they had to, they had to fight their way back in, basically. The airport scenes, you'll remember them. The 82nd Airborne secured that airport in 24 hours. And there were, for the most part, other than that tragic suicide bombing at Abbey Gate, uh, it, was an, it was an unbelievable effort. You had military planes landing every 45 minutes, lifting people off to sta safety. Is is it heartbreaking for uh, the military commanders that they had to leave anyone behind? Obviously. I just asked General McKenzie how he feels after 20 years of war handing the country that they had seized from the Taliban after 9-11 back to the very same Taliban. I can't imagine that anybody in this country, any American citizen, is going to be unchanged by what we've just been through, mm -hmm. not only from the last 20 years, but for the last two weeks. Katie has a question for you, Jen. Jennifer, thank you so much for all of your reporting over the past two weeks, but also over the years to bring Americans and our audience the most important information on this very crucial topic. Um, I think there's some questions about a lot of Americans thought this was happening tomorrow. It happened today. Tomorrow is August 31st. Obviously, there's a time difference with yeah. Afghanistan. But can you talk about what the general said about that in the briefing? Well, Katie, I think it's a good point. And certainly, they had up until midnight on August 31st in Afghanistan to uh, to leave. That was the deadline. That would have been about 3.30 p.m. Eastern time. But as you know, with the military, there's always operational security um, considerations. And if you look at those five rockets that were fired at the airport last night, the fact that they stopped a massive vehicle with uh, explosives and had to carry out a drone strike with, against two suicide bombers in that vehicle uh, earlier in the day, uh, there was a sense that time was of the essence. And I think it's no surprise that those planes would have taken off. Um, um, you know, it was August 31st in Afghanistan. It was, it's eight and a half hours ahead of us right now. And so they left on August 31st. That was the deadline. Uh, they left and they did not leave under fire. So and they got people out safely. And I think that was the that was the ultimate goal of the mission. Jen, here's Greg. Just uh, um, you brought up the drone strike. What uh, do we have any more information on the casualties the people killed? We really don't. And um, CENTCOM is investigating. If you're talking about, there were two drone strikes, obviously mm -hmm. one from Friday and then one uh, on Sunday. And that drone strike uh, that took place in the Kabul neighborhood, about two miles from the airport, that was in a very dense Kabul neighborhood. So. Uh, I would be shocked if there were not civilian casualties. The military takes that very seriously. CENTCOM is investigating. Uh, from initial reports, we've heard that it was from the uh, secondary explo explosions, from the explosives that were in that vehicle. Those two suicide bombers were packing those explosives in the vehicle, we were told earlier today. And there may have been civilian casualties, and, and that obviously was not the goal, but the danger in terms of allowing that vehicle to head towards the airport, so the devastation would have been much greater. Geraldo has one for you, and then I've got one as well. General McKenzie, uh, Jen, spoke of the pragmatic relationship of necessity with a long-term enemy, uh, having to deal with the, with the Taliban. I'm of the school that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. The Taliban hates ISIS. That makes the Taliban, in this formulation, my friend. I want the Taliban to snitch on ISIS. I want the Taliban to go after ISIS. Is that the feeling in the building that, that the Taliban will be an unusual partner? I mean, Germany joined us against Russia. Japan joined us against China. Uh, is there a feeling that the Taliban will join us against ISIS? It was an absolute marriage of necessity in these last two weeks to have to deal with the Taliban, to have to negotiate with the Taliban, to have Taliban provide security at the perimeter of the airport. That is not a relationship that I envision continuing. I believe that the way the U.S. military sees it is that, uh, I, that the Taliban and ISIS 
will go at it now. And the U.S. will keep an eye on things and make sure that nobody uh, leaves the country and poses a threat to the U.S. homeland or other countries. Uh, but as long as they're engaged on the ground in Afghanistan, I think from the military perspective, the U.S. military perspective, that's a good thing. You heard General McKenzie say that the Taliban were both pragmatic and businesslike. Those were his words in these last two weeks. The Taliban wanted the U.S. to leave. General McKenzie met with Mullah Baradar at the beginning after August 14th. He met with him in Doha, Qatar, and he told him that if any U.S. troops were killed, if the Taliban struck against the U.S. forces at the airport, that the U.S. would respond forcefully. That message was received loud and clear from the Taliban. And so now this moves into a new phase. The Department of State will use whatever leverage it has left, not necessarily military leverage, but leverage in terms of the world community. Um, and they will use that leverage to try and get the any Americans who are left, uh, who want to leave out, and also any Afghan allies who are threatened by the Taliban, they will be working tirelessly to do that. Jim, sure. Greg's got a comment here. Well, I, one of the things about the enemy of my enemy is my friend is that that can work in reverse ways. If ISIS hates us, then why can't they join Taliban? That's the problem with the enemy versus enemy <laughs> thing. Exactly. So we never assure. And I know that this might have already been answered over the weekend, but, you know, were there any Taliban killed in the suicide bombing? I don't know. It's a the Taliban say so, yes. They so did? It is reasonable to assume. Yeah. Really? It was 120 killed. Yeah. That's a pretty big blast rate. I just haven't heard but it, that's all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Jen, I did have a, a question about um, you know, the interpreters and other helpers. Um, there have been some private efforts uh, going on to try to help them get out. Uh, a lot of them were turned away, sometimes paperwork issues, whatever it might have been, couldn't get to the airport. A lot of them, from our reporting, what we're hearing is that they are being targeted and hunted down. Um, where does that go from here? Well, Dana, it's interesting. In the last two weeks, it was not paperwork issues that were the problem. Those restrictions were dropped as soon as the Taliban took over and the U.S. military went back in to begin these evacuations. Uh, so those, uh, the paperwork was no longer an issue. The issue, and we saw this in real time, the issue was getting those vulnerable Afghans, those Afghan allies, whether they were SIVs or people who had worked in, in some form uh, with the U.S. government or women's groups who, who are now going to be targeted by the Taliban. The real issue was getting through Taliban checkpoints. The Taliban were willing to let Americans through, and they were willing to let green hard card holders through. That's what they told the U.S. military. Sometimes they would turn a blind eye and let a group of Afghans through, but they were be they did not want educated Afghans to be leaving the country. They need them to build the country. And so the real problem for most of the SIVs and, and others who wanted to get to the airport was that those Taliban checkpoints on the periphery, people would try five, six times. We would be on the phone with them and hearing how they would get turned back at that checkpoint. And it was mm. absolutely gut-wrenching. So now we move into a new phase. Perhaps there will be a land bridge corridor uh, out of the country where convoys of some of these vulnerable Afghans will be escorted by, by uh, friendly countries who maybe are still on the ground in Afghanistan working with the State Department. But those efforts are continuing. They're just moving into a new phase. Got it. Um, we, we want to go to Trey Yings. He's in Doha, Qatar. But before we do, just Pete, let me ask you if you want to comment on anything that was said. So yeah, far. no, they, Jennifer, great, great understanding of the situation on the ground. You know, as was mentioned in the briefing, they said a few hundred are left behind. You mentioned the enemy. We've talked about the enemy of my enemy. Uh, how does, in a dynamic situation like that, when we know American citizens are left behind, we know SIV holders are left behind, the Taliban can spin it as we need their skills, but they now have their names and their biometric data in many cases, which makes them targets. What leverage do we have to prevent, in the, in the middle of a civil war, which is likely to un be unleashed, prevent these American citizens or allies of ours from becoming hostages, from becoming uh, poker chips in a game between two groups that want that leverage? I think that's a real, a very serious danger, Pete. And uh, any American citizen who is left behind, um, it, they are vulnerable to hostage taking. Um, uh, we know of one hostage who is still being held by the Haqqani network. Uh, but the real, the really the vulnerable, the most vulnerable people, I think, are those who worked as translators and worked in or or 
members of the ANA, the Afghan National Army, the Special Forces, the people who fought alongside the U.S. military, those people left behind, the Taliban, they're going to be the, at the top of the list for the Taliban going to seek retribution. I find it hard to believe that the Taliban would want to go and seek out and kill Americans. You're right, they could be hostage and bargaining chips, but but the, the ones are, that are most vulnerable are Afghans who worked with us and who weren't able to get out. Jen, thanks so much. You'll stand by. Trey Yanks has been in Doha, Qatar for us. And Trey, let's get your thoughts on what you're hearing, hearing and seeing as um, one book ends and another one begins. Well, look, we heard CENTCOM General Frank McKenzie breaking down the numbers. 6,000 Americans evacuated since the Taliban took over. But you still have 250, according to the U.S. State Department, on the ground in Afghanistan. And this question of leverage will be the question on everyone's mind moving forward. The United States does not have much leverage over the Taliban in terms of negotiating the safe passage, not only of these Americans, but those estimated 80,000 special immigrant visa holders, Afghans, who helped the United States over the past 20 years to make their way out of the country. It's such a dire situation on the ground. We're seeing reports out of countries like Iran and Pakistan and Tajikistan of Afghans fleeing on foot. The United Nations estimating over the next few weeks half a million Afghans could flee the country over land borders because they don't have this critical air bridge anymore. And that leverage question is going to remain about how the United States will be able to use diplomacy. We heard General McKenzie basically say that they will have to rely not only on allies, but that loose relationship with the Taliban, saying we're going to negotiate very hard and very aggressively to get those Afghans out. What those negotiations will look like, it's really anyone's guess. Thank you. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Greg. Well, the, I think this is like a, a, a key point here. It, it isn't about the military. This was not a successful airlift. I'm sorry, it wasn't. We 120,000? I mean, no, this is the worst military operation I've ever seen, and it had nothing to do with the military. It had to do with a government that let them down. We are the greatest military uh, uh, on earth, and we, are at the, we have to rely on the Taliban. <laughs> Just putting that sentence together makes you sad. And I, 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 I we know lost that we the have, war, dude. I, I know we did. Oh, I, I know that. And, I, and by the way, I'm very happy that we're getting out of there. But we cannot forget how awful this was and how it let down a lot of people. For, for There are a lot of veterans who are looking at this and they're sick to their stomach. And I, I think the idea of saying how successful this is, we're polishing a turd.